Hello. I'm going to talk about chocolate chip cookies. I promise I'll get to technology and relationships in a minute, but first I want you to play along with me and think about the very first time that you ate a warm chocolate chip cookie. Smell the fresh baked cookie smell. Taste the silky molten chocolate. Maybe even see the face of the person who gave it to you. Feel the slightly crisp edge where the sugar caramelized onto the pan. So how many of you want a cookie now? While you were doing that, I'm willing to bet your body started doing some things you didn't even have to think about, like your mouth watering, your uh, digestive system getting ready for the cookie. Well, your body connected all of those experiences together with your very first cookie, and it strengthened that connection since your first cookie. What you've just experienced is the effect of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the process by which neural pathways are formed through repeated experiences. And the idea that your body connects, hold on, my clicker's not working. Can you move it for me? The idea that your body connects um, experiences through repeated occurrences was first put forth by Dr. Donald Hebb in 1949. And so basically, this pretty common quote means that your body is an efficient machine and it bundles experiences together instead of trying to break, make brand new connections with each experience that you have. This isn't really a new idea, um, but ironically, Dr. Hebb probably didn't understand that how relevant that expression would be in an age that we use wireless technologies to try and connect ourselves to other people. For example, if I show you this emoji, you all get what it means. Nature, trees, outdoors. I can change up the shape of the tree, change the meaning a little bit. I can even add some decorations to the tree. We still get it because it's a shared symbol. If I switch up and use pictures of familiar places, then you activate even stronger connections, more neural pathways. More often than not, you experience familiar places with people who are important to you, either for good reasons or bad. And so now, when you see pictures of familiar places, you associate those places with a specific memory of a specific person. You probably even have an emotional reaction or a physical sensation associated with them. I know I had an emotional reaction when I saw the bronze bear at the bottom of a sewer last week after the accident. So from a relationship scientist's uh, perspective, I study patterns of interaction between people. And so foundational knowledge in my field says that we establish these patterns of interaction that we, with key other people, and then we generalize those patterns to other areas of our life. And so through repeated activation of those patterns of interaction, we then create and maintain patterns of biological responses to other people and develop our biological capacity for connection. And I just think that's pretty cool. So when technology grew from business and academic applications to pretty much how we relate to other people, I was really interested in what that meant for couples' relationships, which is kind of my bailiwick. So for example, uh, recently I added a section to a class that I teach on relationships, and I had to accommodate social media-based dating scripts. So I'd be talking in class, and I'd be talking about attraction and self-disclosure and all the ways that we get to know each other through uh, exchanging information. And my student said to me, uh, Dr. Gagne, yeah, we all know that stuff already because we Facebook stalked them. And then the kicker to me was they said when they finally got together with the person, they couldn't admit that they'd looked up all of that information because then they would seem like an actual stalker. That was a revelation to me, and existing literature in my field really hasn't accommodated that cultural shift in how we get information about somebody. The ability to vet potential partners based on this wealth of information that's out there, a lot of times in that person's own words, is fascinating in terms of understanding how digital natives form relationships. So two separate but related questions kind of emerged from this revelation. The first one is, 
When digital natives kind of relate to each other using text-based communication, what's being wired together? Basically, young adults and adolescents have been socialized into relationships using technology. So with this new way of relating, how does that then shape our biological responses to each other, which then influences our emotional experiences? The second question, of course, is then, what connections are the kids of digital natives making or not making that are essential to their biological development and their ability to then form relationships? So first, we're going to talk about adults' physiology when we begin to associate and relate more to our devices than we do to other people. So as a family therapist, I um, often tell my clients that operating purely from a head perspective or purely from a heart perspective doesn't really work very well. That your head and your heart need to talk to each other and have some sort of balance between rational thought and emotional response. Turns out, your brain and your heart really do talk to one another through something called the vagus nerve, which connects them. And the strength of that connection is what we call vagal tone. Vagal tone is really helpful in understanding people's overall health. For example, strong vagal tone indicates that you have a strong cardiovascular system, a strong immune system, and even better ability to re regulate blood glucose. So from a relationship science perspective, vagal tone also tells us things about facial expressivity and emotional regulation, the ability to be in tune with human vocal frequencies. That seems really weird, doesn't it? That the same mechanism in your body that tells people how well your heart's pumping blood also tells us how well you relate to other people. It's weird, but true. I don't make this stuff up. So vagal tone is really important in understanding how some of those things that help us relate to other people. My name's Jeff, and I'm an Instagram husband. I'm basically a human selfie stick. Go. Last year for Christmas, I actually got her a selfie stick, and then she got mad at me because she thought I was just trying to get out of taking photos. It's become a pretty big problem. Um, we take so long to get anywhere because we're taking pictures of our feet. Oh, shoe pick, shoe pick. No, this one's better. No, no, stop, stop. Move your foot. Okay, can we hold hands? One more, one more. I like this leaf right here. Yeah, we used to eat our food. Now we just take pictures of it. No! You can't do that! I haven't taken a shot of that yet! God, we have to show everybody how much we enjoy our lives together. Yeah, that's really <laughs> enjoyable. So in other words, your heart is a use it or lose it organ. With respect to your physical health, weak, uh, weak heart muscles from lack of exercise, but also with regard to your emotional health, their decreased biological capacity for connection. This funny skit may show us some of the ways that social media influences our uh, relationship experiences and our physiological responses to each other. What's being wired together here? What neural pathways are being strengthened? We don't know if the women in the video have poor vagal tone, leading to their decreased ability to relate to other people, but we sure know that his relationship experiences are being strengthened, right, and reinforced. So, it's not hard to imagine, then, that she becomes associated with feeling devalued and not understood. Um, and it's really not hard to imagine, then, that he becomes further disconnected from her, from the relationship, leading to poor interpersonal skills and decreased vagal tone. Weak vagal tone and decreased connection, connective tissue in the brain is related to a whole bunch of other things, like inability to emotionally regulate, the inability to take another's perspective, um, difficulty managing confrontation, and difficulty managing intense emotions. Take fubbing, for example. Maybe heard of fubbing? That is phone snubbing. When you ignore the people around you in favor of your device. So, <laughs> When you fub someone, consciously or not, you are choosing to ignore the people around you and strengthening the neural pathway for ignoring other people. So choosing to not experience or interpret their facial expression, thereby potentially decreasing your vagal tone and decreasing your overall health. 
When someone fubs you, in turn, your body links the associated stress response of being ignored to the feelings of being devalued, the person, the context. So recent research really indicates that fubbing results in increased depressive symptoms and decreased overall well-being for both the fubby, but also for the fubber. Another tech example of the ways that poor vagal tone and social media are connected to our relationship experiences is through a newly named phenomenon called ghosting. Have you heard of that one either? Ghosting is when, you know, you don't really feel like breaking up with somebody because it's really complicated and awkward and hard and uncomfortable. So you pretty much just so disappear from their social network, right? Their social media accounts, you don't respond to texts or emails because it's easier. So now ghosting might have occurred prior to social media, but probably not because most relationships were somewhat geographically based. And so you kind of had to at some point face them and have the confrontation. So decreased vagal tone in digital natives can, is also related to um, some kind of leaving digital natives ill-equipped to handle strong and intense emotions. And some other evidence for that exists in the increased rate of anxiety disorders being diagnosed in young adults and adolescents. Increased amounts of medications for depression and anxiety for the same population. And the increased number of suicides on college campuses. So that's pretty much all of our stuff about uh, adult physiology and how it's related to social media. Let's go back to that question of children let me advance, please. And what happens to the kids of digital natives when their parents are more preoccupied with their phones than with the kids? So if you understand child development, you know that kids are engaged in rapid neural migration and neurogenesis, and that by interacting with them, you're really stimulating their ability to relate to others as well as their cognitive abilities. Research shows us that when you talk to kids more often, speaking, reading to them, you really increase their ability to acquire language and can relate to other people, as well as all sorts of other things that are related to academics. Well, when children don't have responsive adults in their lives, they get really stressed out. And their chronic stress then impedes their biological ability to develop at an appropriate pace, as well as their ability to relate to other people. And so infants that experience toxic stress when they have an, a primary caregiver that's not emotionally responsive to them or ignore them, um, it really gets in the way of their ability to develop interpersonal relationships. So to show you just how quickly infants and young children experience that toxic stress, I've adapted Tronic's still face experiment for when parents are preoccupied with their devices instead of paying attention to their kids. So you can see mom engaging with her baby using noise in his name. Engaging in a familiar game they've played before. And it works. He responds to her, looks at her, continues to explore his environment, but engages with her. Now what, ha what happens when mom pulls away and starts paying attention to her phone? He's still exploring and trying to figure it out. Within 10 seconds, he's using vocalizations to try and re-engage her. Within 30 seconds, he's upping the ante and getting a little louder. Within a minute, he's ticked and upset. Then he remembers the game. Hey, we played this neat game. Didn't you want to play the game with me? That didn't work. Within a minute and a half, he's really stressed out to the point of arching his back. No infants were harmed in the filming of this experiment. <laughs> a pediatrician in Seattle um, realized that her 
the, the parents of the kids in her office were really ignoring their kids while they were there in favor of their phones. So she conducted this unofficial experiment and observed parents while they were at dinner with their kids in fast food restaurants. And what she found was that the majority of parents didn't interact with their kids at all during the meal, and in fact, most of them never even put down their phone. Catherine Steiner there followed up on that unofficial experiment with an actual one where she interviewed 1,000 children between the ages of 8 and 18 about their parents' cell phone use. And the kids had pretty strong reactions to their experiences, and they used words like sad and mad and angry and lonely. They happily recalled trying to solve the problem by hiding their parents' phone, putting it in the oven, and even trying to flush it down the toilet. So one little girl's quote really stands out to me. She said, I'm just boring. I'm just boring because my dad will take any call, any text, any time, even if we're on the ski lift. So research tells us just how malleable young children's developing brains really are. And Steiner Adair's work shows us the emotional toll that might take on kids. But the new information that links biological capacity for connection with those experiences really rounds out our knowledge about the connection between your body and your mind and your emotions and your relationships. As a field, we're starting to understand that we literally train our bodies to connect with other people, or not. Now, sorry. Some of this information might be really interesting to you, might make you a little bit uncomfortable, maybe even a little bit defensive. Mobile technology is not the end of all healthy relationships, but understanding the ways that you have physiological responses to your experiences is really helpful. You can cr increase your vagal tone by seeking face-to-face -face interactions, by practicing being attuned to others' emotional experience, by engaging in mindfulness and meditation behaviors. By doing so, you will increase your ability to regulate your body, keeping you healthier, and increase your ability to regulate your emotions, keeping your relationships healthier. Thank you.